Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 457. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's November the 12th, the day after the 100th anniversary of the ending of the First World War. Gavin, welcome back to the program. Uh, for those of you who just watched the program with George, yes, it's the same day and I have the same cold. And so I'm going to have Gavin do most of the talking. Uh, we do that anyway, but I just wanted you to, we're going to do it on purpose today because <laughs> oh, I, I sound horrible. I have no voice and I keep coughing and my nose is all stuffed up. And that's enough details with me. How are you doing, Gavin? Kevin, some people would say your voice sounds very attractive. <laughs> husky but, and... <laughs> yeah, husky. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you if doing, you like Gavin? husky voices. Yeah. Kevin, I'm fine, thank you. I'm, 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 I'm very well indeed. It's, it's, it's raining, so you, you may hear uh, a thousand pattering footsteps on my, on my roof above my head, but it's just English rain uh, <laughs> falling on a dark November evening. Um, but, I, right. but, but I myself, I'm, 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 ex I'm extremely well. Thank you. That's good. We have a little audio delay going on back and forth between uh, y your place and my place, which is that's that's okay. You, we, the technology that allowing us to talk is amazing. So let's get on a little with the show here. Before we start, I need you guys to like, share, comment, subscribe. You know, we're now getting about 20 comments per episode, and that's great. Some are up to 50. Uh, we want to encourage you to do that. If you want to do the podcast, Go to our show notes and you can subscribe to the podcast. Um, the newest news I hear, uh, we talked last week about uh, Aja Bibi uh, was released from Pakistan. And I thought she was going to get asylum in Britain, Is but I haven't seen anything about that. What's the update? Well, it's strange, Kevin. The answer is that there is no news, but mm. then different people have been interpreting this no news in two different ways. So the knock-on effects of this woman's case uh, have been quite serious. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first piece of news is that there's a, there's a president of the Pakistani Christian Association. He's, he's very well known. His name is Wilson Chowdhury. And he gave an interview to the Huffington Post and said that he had it on very good authority that the British government had refused to give her asylum because of not wanting to upset Islam. Uh, now, this has had two effects. One is it's upset Christians in this country a great deal because we have been welcoming back returning jihadists. Uh, we have been on the receiving end of a, a certain amount of, of, of Islamic immigration. Uh, and, so, and also when it was a when there was an issue about giving Syrians uh, asylum, the Home Office, uh, sorry, the Foreign Office gave no Christian or Syrians asylum at all. They were all That's Muslim correct. Syrians. Yep. And so again, a fuss was made about that saying, are, are you anti-Christian at the heart of the British government? Because it looks like you are. So Azia Bibi becomes another test case. Now, um, Wilson Chowdhury says he's been told they've not, they've not given her asylum. And certainly, they haven't given her. Now, there are, the liberal Christians are saying, well, that doesn't mean they've refused her. It just means you don't know anything. Uh, so now there's an argument going on between liberal Christians and Orthodox Christians on Twitter, in particular, between the editor of Christianity Today, Mark Woods, and me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying um, uh, that there are secular commentators like Douglas Murray, who wrote that very famous book about the death of Europe, at the hands of Islamic immigration. Yep. And Douglas Murray is saying this is the first time when we can see the government pandering to Islamic minority in a way that is changing both public policy and he thinks foreign policy too. So now if, if Great Britain uh, Islamifies its foreign policy, that's a matter of the most serious concern. So Douglas Murray is saying that the Times, uh, which hardly ever comes over to the center of politics from its left-leaning stance. The Times wrote a leader today saying, the silence by the government on Asia Bibi is shameful. And the only person who's saying, yeah, it's completely okay, are the Christian left, who say, there's nothing to worry about. We don't know anything. 
don't 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 buy into this horrible anti-islamic narrative well i'm not surprised but i am absolutely disappointed in the church of england for no response to this and other you know eventualities where christians were persecuted within and outside of uh england uh here's a lady who's uh persecuted uh, only for her faith uh she was accused of blasphemy and uh, was going to be killed is being released by pakistan uh the church of england should say send her here with welcome arms you know uh and nothing wouldn't it be wonderful kevin wouldn't it be wonderful if we had i don't know let's say somebody as senior as an archbishop of york Let, let's say we had a, a, a black archbishop of york who'd been persecuted in a country like uganda under mm -hmm. under someone horrible like idi Amin. sure and, and in those circumstances he might be able who knows to empathize with somebody whose Christian faith had brought them to imprisonment. And, and if we had such a person, do you not think, well, he'd be in a position to speak out on behalf of persecuted uh, foreign Christians everywhere and speak to the government. But we do have such a person and he hasn't said anything. Neither he nor the archbishop nor any of the bishops have stood up for international Christians and persecution. And again, you have to ask, you know, why, why are they so completely silent? All right, this morning you sent me a letter from a person who sent you a letter of something that they were going to publish. Because it's not published yet, I'm not going to name the person, but I did want to talk about the article because hopefully tomorrow it will be published. And it talks a little bit about the, the change within the Church of England uh, over the last couple of years, um, mentioning uh, uh, certainly Jeffrey John and uh, Oxford and you know some of the changes happened i thought i could talk to you about it but we're not going to name the author hoping the author will publish it are you willing to do that well the, the author we can do that the author is okay. a very well regarded conservative traditionalist who 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 uh has very high standards about what he writes okay and as he's been slightly ill and hasn't had a chance to polish his grammar uh he 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 doesn't want to put this in the public arena until all the grammar is in the right place. So I think, can I talk about it? Said, you can talk, you can about, talk it, about it, but I don't want you at all to mention the grammar. All right, we're just going to talk about <laughs> so, the letter itself. So what does the letter say? Well, the, the letter carries on from the conversation you and I were having last week or, or eight or nine days ago, when the Diocese of Oxford wrote an ad clerum to its clergy, mm -hmm. uh, following the Diocese of Litchfield, mm -hmm and saying uh, essentially um, we are moving fast in a pro-LGBT direction and we'd be happy to have all your questions and all your concerns so we can protect you and advise you because we know you need a great deal of advice from us. Um, and w the author of this paper um, hasn't written anything that's particularly uh, profound. He's simply drawn a timeline and he said just, just compare for a moment 2018 with 2003 to get a sense of what's happened to the Church of England. Now, you may remember in 2003, Richard Harris, a very progressive liberal Bishop of Oxford, wanted to promote Geoffrey John, the gay Dean of St. Albans, uh, though I think at the time he was a canon at Southwark Cathedral, mm -hmm. uh, to become his suffragan bishop. And a large number of evangelical churches in the Diocese of Oxford said, we, we're not going to let you do that. We, we, this, this is against tradition, it's against scripture, and we will bring sanctions to bear against you, Bishop, and the diocese if you do this. And essentially, they meant, they meant money. Now, uh, the Bishop, Bishop Harris backed down. It was a test case. It was, it was near the beginning of this relentless, progressive, chess match I talked about it was one of the opening moves and and they lost it and backed down now 15 years later what's happened well, in 2017 one of the things that happened was Justin Welby took a bishop's report to the general synod uh, and uh, it, it trying to, to hold the line against changes of doctrine and the liberals voted it down hours and hours and hours been spent in finding a kind of delicate compromise position as they thought between progressive and traditional christianity yeah. and, and there the was no little said, ground to be had was there 
No, there was there wasn't. The progressives said, "We're not having this. You, you, if mm. you're not going to give us everything we want, we're not playing with you." And Justin Welby was was very upset by that because he sees himself as being a, a fixer, and he thought he could fix it. So then he lent lent over backwards to the liberals and said, "That's when he began to talk about radical inclusion and and uh, pastoral resources." And now, since that moment, emboldened by that, there has been a, an, an outburst across the Church of England of rainbow flags on cathedrals, rainbow Eucharist in, in cathedrals, uh, ad clerons from Lichfield and Oxford, essentially pushing the agenda remorselessly forward. Now, the author of the paper said the real difference is that in 2003, there was an orthodox body of evangelical churches at the least in the diocese of oxford and probably mirrored across the country in in thicker and thinner patches that said no you can't do this they've disappeared mm -hmm. they have yeah. evaporated yeah. They've, they've, they've either they might be split into factions or else they've lost their nerve and they've begun to go over to the this this new progressive pansexual culture and essentially what what the author is saying is the progressives have won. They have full control of the Church of England. The opposition is there. And the very fact that Litchfield and, and Oxford dioceses can produce these letters and there is no opposition to gainsay them says the game is up. Uh, no, the, it's, the it's interesting. Has become yeah, just it all it was time. All I had to do was wait us out. Uh, the Orthodox will go elsewhere. The, uh, the, the true believers will uh, find a place where they can worship without persecution, without interference from bishops and uh, uh, other leaders within the church. And uh, they certainly found that in Gafka. And they found that uh, uh, in, well, some of them, they're coming back already, the Roman Catholic Church. I, I have two friends who went over who are now coming back because uh, Rome was not uh, what they thought it would be. Um, we have to see and, and sit and watch on this, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the liberals have def uh, won uh, the Church of England. I don't think there's any, any argument there at all. They really have. And, and, and what this means is that uh, it is past time for the traditionalists to get their act together Mm -hmm. to provide a safe home for the people within the Church of England uh, who, in all conscience, cannot accept this perversion of Christian teaching. Uh, we, we have to have some kind of English ACNA. And the, the difficulty is we are still too split amongst ourselves. We, we are under some kind of judgment. This, this, there are factions still dividing the Orthodox in England. We have to overcome them and work together. And, and find one single Episcopal structure that will provide the equivalent of an ACNA. God give us Robert Duncan or the equivalent, yeah. uh, who has the, has the charism and the authority uh, and, and the grace of the Holy Spirit to do that, because we don't have it at the moment. No, it'll take time. But I, I think now that we've understood that there's just no hope in the Church of England, uh, it's going to give GAFCON more of you know a shining star within England to go forward a lot of people are waiting for this moment and the moment's here and I think uh, when this article is published tomorrow that uh, people can see the timeline more clearly let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the armistice um, you know for the 16th 17th and 18th uh, 19th centuries all we've known is war world wars um, and it, you know, it's something horrible about mankind where we are willing to fight to the death for borders, for religion, for power, for you know, so many different things, the spoils of war. Um, and we've left you know, in our wake millions and millions of dead people, uh, soldiers who've uh, fought to the death in trench wars where for years they fought and gained nothing. Um, and uh, the armistice is the celebration of the end of World War One. And um, tell us you know, a little bit about how Europe is at, uh, in appreciating this 100-year armistice. Something's changed, Kevin. Since I since I was a child, something's changed in the last five years. I think uh, in, um, in in previous years there was a sense that 
although the first and the second world wars were were different um we were simply lamenting the loss of life on an enormous scale and it, it's true that a few people said look, nationalism played its part in that but the fact was that the the causes of the first world war in particular are really quite opaque uh, but to my mind they are essentially they are nationalism they were colonialism expansionism the mm. chasing of resources in africa um there was so there was a kind of 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 very dangerous a cocktail between uh, uh expansionist greed and, and nationalist pride that's true the Second World War grew out of the First World War, but it was an, a very different thing indeed. It, it was an ideological war uh, with, with German fascism, which was certainly based on a kind of nationalism, mm. uh, embodying a most profound authoritarian evil. Now, the difficulty is that the narrative that the European Union has been spinning in the last 30 years is, well, we have produced peace. It, it just as an just as an antidote to what you were describing, I know three hundred, four hundred, five hundred years of of nationalistic struggle in Europe. Now there's peace, and it's all because of the European Union and a kind of globalized cooperation. I was reading a a liberal a, a liberal woman theologian saying, "Look at Tillich. Look at um, uh, who is that twentieth uh, century scientist? Teilhard de Chardin. That's look right. at Tillich. Look at Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, even look at Bach. They, they, they're all saying what we need is kind of church unity and interfaith unity um a form of religious extension of the european community now the, the fact is that as you were remarking to me before we started nationalism alive and well and it's certainly living in france <laughs> but but what <laughs> but the 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 problem i think is that the politicians like generals are fighting the last war the problem is not creeping nationalism creeping up from behind us over the last 100 or 500 years the problem is with authoritarian utopianism in other words a, a controlling ideology that wants to provide a perfect society now we're getting that essentially from the new left so the the real danger is in fact precisely with what what uh, feeds the ideology behind the european union and a kind of global one world government um, whereas what they're really saying is any nationalism is to be knocked on the head because it's it, it, it link it will re, re uh, energize the same energies that led to the first world war. but in fact of course today nationalism would be an antidote to mass migration to lack of self-confidence to social incohesion uh, in a strange kind of way for the first time we need a bit of nationalism the right kind in order to provide social glue so the 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 history is being rewritten by I, ideologues uh and it's it's there was some conf there was some pain i think and some confusion about the way in which we celebrated the end of the war because we're now trying to uh construct new narratives that change the way the conflicts have been understood in the past now I, I, there's a lot of truth to that and you can't walk into a French restaurant and speak to the garçon and try and imit, you know, to, to speak in French with your broken English accent without them getting all offended that you would speak to them in <laughs> French because you do not know French. I mean, the, it, I, of all the countries I can think of, France would be the most nationalistic uh, of all of them. And so I saw that conversation going on the last two days coming from the, uh, the celebration of the armistice. And I'm like, oh boy. You know, different definitions of nationalism. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. They well, are the, rewriting the, history. The thing, I think you're right on that. The other really interesting thing is that the the people who are claiming a right to national identity are doing it hand in hand with a resurgent Christian faith. So what we have is Poland saying we are not going to swallow the pseudo non-nationalism of Germany and France because we want to keep our Christian tradition and our own borders. Hungary is saying the same thing. To some extent, I know Russia is a very mixed bag and Putin upsets people and excites them in, in, in equal order. But nonetheless, P Putin is one of the few l political leaders who says our civilization is based on Judeo-Christianity and we're determined to preserve it. So we, we, effectively, I see at any rate a, a form of, of 
new healthy nationalism which is energized by Christian faith and an understanding some of the best things in our culture have been given to us by the gospel against a secularized more global uh, uh, unlimited immigration ideology that runs the EU uh, you know and, and people say that George Soros and other people are 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 behind an attempt to uh, unglue Christian culture that has held us together for a while. Okay. This is contentious and people have to make their own minds, but that's how I see it. <laughs> oh, I have to agree with you. This has been episode 457. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's also been the 12th of November. That was my line, Kevin. Your cold has gone to your head. I just, it's really <laughs> bad. It's so bad. I'm on so many drugs right now. It's just like... <laughs> I've been remembering that four, five, seven, all the way through. I even had a little mnemonic: four, 1945, the end of the war; seven, the perfect number. And and and, and I, 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 I